welcome to the second conversation. Um, I would love to just start, come on. Um, I would love to just start by doing a little ritual that I like to start with all of um, my processes. And I want to talk to the spill out room, spill out room, yeah! I see you spill out room. Okay, we're going to take three breaths together, yes? Um, and we'll just, if you got room, you don't have that much room, you could just bring your hands up. And then heart center, yes? So we'll take a big breath up. And breathe out. Let's take another big breath up. Out and our last big breath up and breathe out. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, so this panel is moderated by me. Who am I? I'm Liliana Blaine Cruz. Um, I'm a director, um, and I'm talking with the wonderful James Ortiz, puppet designer. Hey. Montana, <laughs> Levi Blanco, costume designer, Palmer Heffron, sound designer, Hi. and Adam Rigg. Did I say set designer? No, sound designer. I did sound, thank you. Adam Rigg, set designer. Oh. Let's give it up for these amazing people. Um, I'm going to be using my phone for notes, so please forgive me. But contrary to Jane's last comment, as a recently over 25-year-old, I am still connected to my screens. Um, and contrary to Brandon Jacob Jenkins' notion of barking, as a director, I like to think I use a very calm, <laughs> collected voice uh, in collaboration with designers. I'm, I just want to say I'm so excited by this um, symposium. I'm so excited by my, my friends and collaborators because I think design is so integral to the visceral experience of theater itself, right? It is what brings it, it's, it to life. It's how we experience the world of a play. And I am just huge admirers of all of these people as individual artists and human beings, yeah? So I wanted to, you know, what the, the premise of this panel is like creating a collaborative aesthetic over time. So I've known most of these folks for most of my creative life. And James is a new addition, but I feel like I've known James most of my creative life. And we'll use the skin of our teeth as a kind of case study for our collaboration, yeah? But before we get into all of that, I'm curious to know, when we talk about aesthetic, we use that word a lot. Aesthetic, what's your aesthetic? <laughs> you got aesthetics, yes. What does it actually mean? How do, we, how do we understand that, and how do you understand that as designers and artists? <laughs> well, I, I, first and foremost, I think aesthetic is, to me, mm -hmm. um, it's an amalgamum of memories, life experience, um, Things like, what was your grandmother's soap dish, right? Like that, and was it, it, was it mint, right? And then for some reason, you have this kind of like innate attraction to mint. I think that, that that's how an aesthetic begins to develop. Um, two cents. Yep. Yeah, I, as a young designer, I think it's the things I'm drawn to initially. And then over time, it becomes kind of my guiding principles. And if someone comes in, hears a show and says, oh, it feels like a Palmer sound design. I used to think that would be scary because it might meant I was recycling ideas, but I think, no, it's my aesthetic. I have a very specific way that I hear the world and how I want that world to be integrated into a wide range of projects. Yeah, for me, it's uh, what I feel comfortable in. Um, a lot of times, like, I think about, like, this aesthetic, my aesthetic goes beyond just my work. It's also like the pencil I choose at the store. Like it's, it's, the, um, it's the socks I pair with my shoes. There's like uh, things that um, I just intrinsically feel comfort in um, and comfortable with and uh, uh, lit up by. And so that, I think that's my, my idea there. Similarly, I, uh, well actually I have no idea what my aesthetic is, but I think, <laughs> I think it is an amalgamation of sort of references and things that you're pulling. Um, but uh, here we are at the end of the sentence and I already forgot what I was gonna say, so <laughs> that's it. It's that, I guess. I guess the thing that I'm always running towards is 
um, you know, puppetry by its nature is already cool and already a piece of spectacle. You don't have to work at that part. That's already done. So because of that, I'm usually running towards like, where's the humor? Where's the playfulness? Where's the, where's the um, heart inside of it? So I guess in a funny way, the aesthetic is like, yeah, yeah, the thing's gonna look great, but like, what's it? What's the other thing? Um, and I actually think that might be where I would land with that. Adam, it sounded like uh, you were also tying aesthetic to lifestyle and yeah. kind of like, and I, and I think that that is also kind of a strong component, right? Like in, in terms of developing your life, your aesthetic, it's also developing, it's, it's curating all these choices, um, socks um, and silverware totally. and all of that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think like uh, my husband jokes often that like, um, I have like these like knee -jer like your aesthetic is a knee jerk reaction too like it's an immediate it's um it's not I don't labor over my aesthetic you know I labor to sometimes break my aesthetic um, but my aesthetic just kind of like comes out without control like I just say no yes like <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and that's interesting to think about impulse and instinct and innate or intrinsic things that feel important to you as you're building a process I will say about design there was a there was a debate it's hard it's, it's a symposium right so we're in conversation with other things even the conversations that happened before but I think when you think about what design is and its uniqueness in relationship to what it means to make theater is that it is a collaborative art form. Your art doesn't exist in isolation. It exists in relationship to each other, right? And I would say that as a combined like aesthetic or the thing that has drawn us together or has evolved over the years is a belief in a certain kind of principle of rules. What is alive? What is exciting? What is thrilling? What feels necessary in relationship to the story itself, you know? And just to just to brag on these folks a little bit, you know, like I think that they're all, you know, tremendously invested in how their art is translated, to use the word from before, into story, right? And so when I think about your work, Adam, it's not just like, cool, we're in a house, here's some couches and some chairs, have a good time, you know? It's, it's what, what is the event of the space and how does that space evoke something true in the heart of the story itself, right? So we think about like the slide in act two of the skin of our teeth. When I think about sound with you, Palmer, and what's alive, if anybody knew how to use subwoofers like Palmer Heffern, <laughs> it's basically the base of reverberating the body through the sound, like that visceralness is part of your aesthetic. Montana, you talk about like the mint on the soap dish, you know, on the, on the, on the you know, kitchen sink. You, I think your interest and um, love for detail, the specificity of that lives down all the way to the fingernails of every single character that you put on stage. You know, James, you were texting me questions about what color should the skin of the dinosaur be and is this quality of texture make sense, you know what I mean, for the, the, the conversational nature of it. So I, I think the, the thing that makes all, everybody's work beautiful is that there's a connection and relationship to not only themselves but the other designs that are in the room. And I wonder if that strikes you as true. I don't think there's a way to do anything that we're doing without it being in constant conversation at all times. And sometimes that just happens based on schedules, like it's in the room and we're in tech and we're going and we're moving. Um, um, but I mean, speaking for myself, it's one of those things where, I, I mean, I'm talking to general management, I'm talking to everybody because um, I, I'm sort of a little uh, hyphenated creature because you know I'm the puppet designer but I'm also the puppet director and what that really means is I'm sort of the puppet acting coach I'm sort of there to sort of get the puppets and the puppeteers on one page and also the people in the scene with them on a certain page because if they're believing in it then we're gonna believe in it then you're gonna believe in it and we can all go home <laughs> um, but um, yeah I, I, I'm in constant conversation endlessly and a lot of it's just trying to like g get little hints of things of you know where's the stylization in this world you know because um, there's not really a way to do that without some hint of stylization but I can go on for days yeah it really feels the way we intersect with our different fields is the level of intricacy and detail that we each bring to those things. We're kind of obsessed with it. We're also obsessed with culture as well, understanding current culture or if we're portraying culture from a different period of time, um, a different place. 
uh, really doing extreme research. And then when you have this wealth of information, being able to distill that to the essential. And so there's clarity when someone sees our work once. We see it many times and we keep trying to deepen and deepen because in that deepening, we're hoping that that one second that that person will only see once will actually hit them the way we have when we've been working on it for months and months and months. I also think about um, the like gift of like a long-term collaboration like this is like a certain level of trust that you um, you don't necessarily get to exercise when you're like a freelance designer going from project to project to project. At times, it's blind trust that you have to engage. Um, but with you know frequent collaborators, like right now on a, a process uh, for White Girl in Danger, like I. For me, I'm reading the script, and the costumes just sound like Montana's gonna like have a playground of like and do everything Montana can do. So for that project, I'm kind of like, well, I'm gonna take a back seat on this one and really give the aesthetics to costumes. And there's just like this trust that that work and the um, the information that needs to be given to the audience, I can I don't need to feel like I have to say everything. You know, I can in this long term kind of thing be like, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna do the doors and windows at this time, you know, because um, I know that Montana is gonna tell the entire story. Like, you know, that, yeah. I think that I would add also um, that there's um, additional collaborations that happen beyond, of course, this stage, right? So I think that my department in particular is charged with. Um, I'm costume. Well, you said that, but I think my department in particular is charged with. Um, translating and kind of sharing what this team has developed, right? So it's like a triangulation of thoughts. It's kind of um, kind of things that I'm inspired by um, internally and kind of research that I'm coming up with. And then that is in conversation with this team. And then that very fragile meal or universe, right? is then presented to the actor. And we have to also bring the performer in because they're the one who inhabits the universe that we've created. Um, so I also feel um, that that collaboration in particular is very important to me. I'm gonna encourage us all to kind of speak into the mic oh, just sorry. for our spill out room. Hey, spill out room. Spill out um, room. Okay, so <laughs> the, um, the uh, so it, uh, one, I think one of the things that we're kind of establishing that I just want to share, and I'm going to keep talking to you guys in a level of hypeness, because I think sometimes when we get to symposiums, we're like, we're just going to sit and chill and actually we're trying to reach your souls. Um, so basically, I, I think that there's a culture of like care, right? And like an acknowledgement, that ethos of care and that ethos of like that every department is interrelated with each other is part of an ethos that then manifests inside of the work itself, which as a director, I'm always interested in, right? Like who has power, who doesn't have power, who, are, who is the outsider, who is the insider, how does that world kind of collide? And then thinking about um, where the play or the event is taking space Right? And who is the culture? What is the culture that we're in relationship to or that we're pushing up against, right? Like Mimi in the last conversation talked about, what does it mean to be in this room, right? Like this room has a certain level of history inside of it. And so when we enter into that space, we are reconciling not only with the content of the shows that we're making, but also the space in which it is happening in. And I think that's uh, an important one as we think about time and context. I, for the sake of time, I'm going to share, because I don't know, how many people saw the skin of our teeth? Yes! Okay, but I'm going to show you some stuff, even though you saw it. Um, we're going to, I'm going to share with you a video, a video reel. Shout out to Hannah Wasileski and E. Zhao, who are also longtime collaborators. But I just want to share a segment of this, because I think it might help illustrate some of the things we're talking about. Lincoln Center Theater takes pleasure in bringing to you the news events of the world. Freeport, Long Island. The sun rose this morning at 6.32 a.m. This gratifying event was first reported by Mrs. Dorothy Stetson of Freeport, Long Island, who promptly telephoned the mayor. The Society for Affirming the End of the World at once went into a special session and postponed the arrival of this event for 24 hours. All honor to Mrs. Stetson for her public spirit. New York City, the Vivian Beaumont Theater. During the daily cleaning of this theater, a number of lost objects were collected as usual by janitors Simpson, Perez, and Asare. 
Among these objects found today was a wedding ring inscribed to Eva from Adam. Genesis 2.18. The ring will be restored to the owner or owners if their credentials are satisfactory. Tippahatchie, Vermont. The unprecedented cold weather of this summer has produced a condition that has not yet been satisfactorily explained. There is a report that a wall of ice is moving southward across these counties. The disruption of communications by the cold wave now crossing the country has rendered exact information difficult. But little credence is given to the rumor that the ice had pushed the Cathedral of Montreal as far as St. Albans, Vermont. For further information, see your daily papers. Excelsior, New Jersey. The home of Mr. George Antrobus, the inventor of the wheel. The discovery of the wheel, following so closely on the discovery of the lever, has centered the attention of the country on Mr. Antrobus of this attractive suburban residence district. This is his home. A commodious seven-room house conveniently situated near a public school, a Methodist church, and a firehouse. It is right handy to a stop and shop. Mr. Antrobus himself becomes a very old stock and has made his way up from next to nothing. It is reported that he was once a gardener, but left that situation under circumstances that have been variously reported. Mr. Antrobus is a veteran of foreign wars and bears a number of scars, front and back. This is Mrs. Antrobus, the charming and gracious president of the Excelsior Mothers Club. Mrs. Antrobus is an excellent needlewoman. It is she who invented the apron on which so many interesting changes have been rung since. Here we see the Antrobuses with their two children, Henry and Gladys, and Fred. The friend in the rear is Lily Sabina, the maid. I know we all want to congratulate this typical American family on its enterprise. We all wish the Antrobuses a successful future. Now, Lincoln Center Theater takes you to the interior of this home for a brief visit. Yeah, so that's kind of what started the show, yes? Um, and already, like, there's so much happening <laughs> inside of it. One, if you don't know, The Skin of Our Teeth is a play written by Thornton Wilder that Brandon Jacob Jenkins made some amazing adjustments in relationship to what does it mean to center a black family in the center of this crazy um, three-act play. But I'm going to just let you guys talk a little bit about where you entered in, knowing that that was kind of the centering of the story, how that impacted your thoughts around design and space, costumes, puppets, etc. cetera. Uh, well, uh, I'll respond di directly to thinking about the Antropuses being black. I, I think what um, fueled and started my design process was um, looking at black, actual black families in history. So we, in Skin of Our Teeth, you have Act One, which is loosely in the 1950s. You have Act Two, which is in the 1920s. And then Act Three is some dystopian post-war um, situation. And we chose, we chose <laughs> to, um, to set Act Three in Reconstruction Era um, Civil War or Reconstruction Era uh, America. And so really looking at specific families, real people, helped to keep um, the design and the ethos grounded. Yep. For Sal, <laughs> uh, Skin of Our Teeth is actually a really, really um, vibrant environmental play. We are dealing with catastrophic events like this glacier iceberg approaching a house in a, you know mid-century, 20th century. Um, and with that, I mean, something that is interesting to think about with race is, is how the environment doesn't see race, you know, regardless of who you are, 
you are going to be experiencing a tornado based on just where you're living. And of course, there's a lot more intricacies of where people are living because of certain things that absolutely deal with race. But in regards to taking this family, treating them as a middle-class family of means, a family that the father could become president of America, um, that still has this impending glacier iceberg um, approaching them. And the same with the hurricane in the act. It's just kind of this this overwhelming um, helplessness we are to Mother Earth. But then the, there's another huge aspect in the play, and it's the music content. And there are two, well, there's the movies that I also sound design and scored, well, with found music, so music editing. Um, but the two big things in the play for me were the top of act two, which we added a dance sequence to, and wanting to play homage to an artist that um, represented both like the 1920s feel. So I um, really like loved this song by Cab Calloway for a long time that was redone by the Trap Killers, which is a Brazilian trap duo, in case you haven't heard of them. <laughs> and it's called Heidi Ho, and it's based on his Mini the Moocher track, was, which was in uh, 1931. Um, it actually might have been 1928 numbers. But anyway, um, it, and so it, it really did this thing that we always look with our aesthetic is like how to contemporize the work, how to bring it to a contemporary audience, regardless of if that audience is a lot older or younger, and blend those. And that song really did that magically. And then at the end, during the Reconstruction era, um, Liliana had this really beautiful song by Moses Sumney, who's a Ghanaian American artist. And it is so different um, orally than the other things that we heard in the play, and it just created this like lo-fi, spacious breath to to kind of absorb the the this beautiful visual that we were exp experiencing. I think uh, scenically we were talking a lot about like uh, middle class homes of the 50s, and um, this gets into like a bigger conversation of like um, a lot of the stuff was like a lot of middle class homes are like pastels and neutrals, and what is neutral when you're dealing with you know darker skin? Um, a lot of the neutrals and pastels that we talk about are pastels that are based upon white people and white skin. So um, when you're trying to like you know, uh, make a, a middle class American home, make it feel like organic and like uh, not surprising or shocking, but how do you like find or turn up those colors in a way that speaks to a black family? Um, so when, and then whenever you start a show with Liliana Blaine Cruz, the first co conversation we have is like, okay, how bright are the colors this time? Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think for us, uh, for, or for me, it was about, um, in the research, finding, you know, it's hard. It's not a well-documented thing to find, you know, black middle-class family homes from the 1950s that are documented in, like, architectural and, uh, you know, catalogs in the way that a white home is. So it was a lot of, like, finding the white homes, finding the, the um, you know, better homes and gardens, and then finding the textiles and the clothing images of black, of black people in the 50s. Um, and trying to marry that in a way that doesn't shock your eyes, that still feels comfortable, that you still feel like when you sit down in the theater, oh, I'm watching uh, Skin of Our Teeth <laughs> at Beaumont Theater, you know, like, uh, and oh, at the Vivian Beaumont. And um, yeah, I think that was, the challenge was, I mean, I'm someone who like, I have, not only do I have undergrad in theater training, like my, my family are theater people, like I was raised in theater, so I feel like, um, I, I was taught like the very young age, the like safety of the white patriarchal architecture that we all kind of like are taught in these programs. Um, so I had that, I, we, a lot of our process was <laughs> Liliana like breaking me of that, you know, like that I do my own personal aesthetics are not that, but like my theatrical aesthetics are. Um, so it like both was a, a helpful, I think, in this process to have that like history with the work and the play, um, but then to also open it up and burst it open, get inside of it, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, there was a, so in some ways I think what everybody is talking about is like one of the things that feels 
um, essential in our aesthetic is how do we move across time <laughs> and incorporate all time in relationship to story. And it's not just like we're making things up. In some ways, it's rooted in like a deep research in the real um, that then gets exploded in relationship to the event itself. And just to say, like, you know, one of the reasons why I was interested in doing the skin of our teeth is because we as a community have all experienced the end of the world, which I'm still not over yet, friends. Like, this is still, we're still encountering that, you know? And I think the urgency of reckoning with that was part of what the, the play was about, but centering this black family as the every man, um, encountering the experience of being on that brink, feeling more profound was, I think, part of the, the choice to center them. And then thinking about the politics of, what does it mean for this black family to have all these resources? Yeah, it's a president. He looks good. <laughs> that collage was amazing. And I, and I think about Hannah's, I wanted to show Hannah's video in particular because it is also like a combination of everybody's work simultaneously, right? So you see the detail of Montana's costumes, the choice of hair, right? You think about um, Adam's lamp, you know what I mean? Kind of floating in the distance and the wallpaper is part of that. You think about the specific choice of what songs you chose to kind of tell this, you know, um, epic story and to place them at the center of that. I'm going to show some photos. How's everybody doing? Yes? All right. Thank you. Here we go. Um, so this is just a still, just to see a little bit of the layers that Montana kind of built in. Montana, you want to say anything before I move on to the next? Um, no, I just wanted to also acknowledge uh, our incredible hair designer, Cookie yes, Jordan, yes. hair and wig designer, and also makeup, um, Kirk Cam uh, Cambridge Pes Pesci. Yep. Let's go to the next image. Thank you. Yeah, flowers. So, plants. I love those things. I love nature. Nature as inherent to our human condition. And again, when we think about how we are destroying our world, yes, I think the plants and animal life being present is in some ways a constant reckoning and a constant awareness of the world that we are a part of. So it's not just for decoration. In some ways, it's a questioning of the world that we are a part of. <laughs> you know what I mean? And how we're destroying it. Yes? And also the puppets were, that was one thing that we were talking about quite a lot because, you know, the, the play is, it's a, it's maybe one of my favorite plays. It's the second time I've worked on it and it was great walking into this one with like, oh, now I really get this play because it's one of those that you need to see like four times and then you're like, oh, got it. Um, but um, the idea of how the first act, it's sort of, they're not fully formed yet, the family. They're, they're still evolving and they sort of become... I don't even want to say perfect at the end, but they, 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 at the end, they, they've been through it and they know how to be better now. So at the beginning of the play is when these giant dinosaurs showed up. And by the way, the reference was always da, 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 constantly. It was like, that's, that's what we're doing. We're doing Jurassic Park. And I went, great. But how big is that? And it's like, no, 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 as big as we can possibly do it. And by making these creatures that are so very large, it, it underlines this idea of sort of man domesticating nature or making it something that can be, you know, simplified and brought into their house. Um, and sure, we're having like, silly jokes of dinosaurs are too busy eating the plants, but th that was sort of at the base of, I think, that. Also, talking about um, collaboration, the puppets wouldn't have made any sense without what Palmer was doing the entire time. You sort of think that these sort of giant sculptures are sort of self-sufficient by themselves, but the reason why you think they're alive is because you can hear them breathing, and the reason why you can hear them breathing is because this one kept all the actors' mics on that were operating them, and you can speak more about what it was. We just pitched them down, and then also James created such beautifully like live monsters <laughs> that the material, the lightness, it was like a crepe paper type sound. And you can really hear those high registers, which during tech were like, woo, there's not magic <laughs> in this. And so we really had to EQ and shape and send it to the, uh, the subwoofers. <laughs> Lilian mentioned I have a tendency to do. Um, so you can also feel the impact of those creatures as they're moving. They could keep the like slowness and weight of their heavy bodies while not being as heavy. And like also a tribute to thinking of like the earth and, and 
and killing it, these animals, these, these dinosaurs you created were so charming and expressive, like feelings, they're so anthropomorphic and beautiful that I feel like that also makes you really see, you, people are like crying when you realize the dinosaurs die in the second act and Mr. Antropus is like, yay, we killed the dinosaurs and everyone's like, no, and it's because of your work. <laughs> Um, I'm going to show some more images real quick, cause, um, and then in about five minutes, we're going to do a real Q&A. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm teasing. Um, let's go for it. Um, the, um, so essentially, I just wanted to give a sense of the scale, right? The Beaumont is one of the largest theaters in New York City, right? And in terms of like what Adam was describing about like using um, an awareness of old models, which I think you should talk a little bit about the proscenium. And oh, yeah, so there's that. like no proscenium. The, the Beaumont is a thrust, and there's like the fourth wall in the text that really exists, and so we, I thought it was really important to actually feel the sense of a fourth wall, and of course the proscenium does that. So we, uh, we mimicked the proscenium from uh, the Schubert, the old Schubert in New Haven where the play first premiered. So we like kind of did like a blown up version of that. And then in this same kind of, as we were looking at like all the kind of uh, plaster or carved work in these, it's always like European. And so we actually, um, mixed in that all of the carvings are actually like uh, Afro-Caribbean and um, some Western African uh, tribal work. So it's like all kind of mixed into there, but it's all painted this gilded gold so that like you feel like you're in an old theater, but actually we're like getting under your skin maybe. Um, yeah. Great. Let's go to the next image. So, oh, did you want to say anything about the dinosaurs anymore before we go forward? No? They're big. They were great. Yeah. <laughs> they were so sweet. They were very large. Um, essentially, I, I just want to give a shout out to E and Hannah, because in some ways you see Hannah's work as a kind of encroaching iceberg is landing on the living room and E creating a fire as the whole kind of community lands at this final moment at the end of Act 1 before we go into Act 2. Let's go to Act 2. Thank you. So look, Atlantic City, this shit is crazy, y'all. It was a three-story slide. <laughs> what? Operational. What does that mean? Talk about it, friends. It was uh, deadly um, the first time. I, like, oh, <laughs> I injured my ankle as the first tester. Um, but we, we, you know, at one point we had a Ferris wheel. Like we, there was something about the um, Sodom and Gomorrah aspect that we were really like talking about a lot and the like... <laughs> the sounds of fucking. Um, so people going down a people going down a slide and like the slam and the scream was something we were really interested in. Um, so we made it and it was dangerous and really fun. <laughs> and then I want to talk about this dance moment and thinking about the community that was built out. Montana, do you want to talk a little bit about like your resources? And also, I can't, t I can't tell if you can see, but there is an amazing man, Bo, who is rocking like a five to six foot showgirl piece in the center. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? He was also one of the main puppeteers of the dinosaur, and yep. it is not possible without those three. Yep. Yeah, I think what was really special about well, well, all the acts because there's uh, the 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 cast of Skin of Our Teeth was 28 people, so that's quite a, a large group of people, and and in a way, um, especially in a dance piece, uh, people the the performers become almost canvas, right? And it's like a painting, um, and so. Um, and this scene in particular, I think um, there's a lot borrowed from maybe kind of operatic scenes where you're creating or costuming people who don't necessarily have a lot of lines, but they're telling a lot of story in their clothes. Um, oh. No, go ahead. I got five minutes. Oh, snap. I thought I got more time. My phone said 2.45, but I realized it, we're on a different schedule. Go ahead, Montana. Sorry. Great. Okay, can we just skip through these next images real fast? Look, a storm is coming. Oh my God, the world is falling apart. Crazy. The storm. This is one of my favorite moments in um, the show, which is another version of the world um, falling apart. And then this is the final scene. We'll pause here. Um, anything else before I'm gonna I'm gonna open up for questions? Yes. I just also want to give a shout out again to um, Hannah and E for the storm sequence. So often I create a world that's just sound, and it can be loud and booming and scary, but 
the grounding, and I mean, it also set in props. We had these giant wind machines. So as the anthropists were trying to get to like their ship, their like <laughs> costumes are blowing in the in the wind. And I've never been able to create what I felt like an impactful experience for the audience to feel the sense of danger that the actors are also portraying because of these like very visceral high definition um, visuals of like the storm waves surging and crashing and we were able to sync those the sounds and lights with those moments with actual lightning usually it's just like a light flash but we had the light flash with the visual of the lightning and yeah I just thought that was an incredible experience to be able to collaborate in that way. I also think the third act was uh, something that for like, uh, what, like 15 years now of working together, Liliana and I always joke like we're gonna break the theater um, because I think that comes from like a place of rage of like not always feeling welcome and feeling like an outsider when we're invited to these spaces. And so as we like built this, it was really important to us in this one that as we like built this kind of, um, uh, like 19th century proscenium and space to actually invest in like the war having a real kind of uh, destructive quality and so actually destroying the proscenium like the whole set's really compressed the whole time with this the screen that we're very the sky while it's massive and huge it's like six feet from the proscenium so you always sense the material and so to actually bust that open and get to this like depth and space and openness and then at the end to reveal that's just more theater um, I think was kind of and I, I just want to add that one thing, and I think this is something that even we may have, at least I kind of discovered through watching previews, is I realized that one of the most prolific threads that Liliana built into Skin of Our Teeth was in each act, there is um, a ritual, a community ritual. So the first act is play, you have the dinosaurs. The second act is dance and debauchery. And then the third act is this procession and kind of more metaphysical, spiritual thing. And I, and I just wanted to include that because I think that that's, it's important to have those larger charges and those larger missions when doing these pieces. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, for our last two minutes, <laughs> do we have do we have any questions? Big picture ones. Yes. Hi, uh, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question for you, Adam, because uh, as you mentioned, the the Vivian Beaumont is huge. So, did you at any point in the process struggle with the scale and <laughs> how to fill the environment? Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> deal with. The um, question is, yeah. did uh, the Beaumont is huge. Did you have a problem with filling it up scale-wise? I have no problem filling a space. Like, <laughs> like, I can find, I can make things, I can design things. I have too many ideas. Um, budgetarily, it was a huge uh, concern. I mean, coming back first show after the pandemic for a, a, you know, a play from the 40s, that's not necessarily like the most popular or successful play in, on Broadway. Um, the original productions closed pretty early. So uh, yeah, filling it was more difficult when it comes to the like reality of being a designer, which is a financial reality, you know? And also a team of like all uh, younger, like BIPOC queer, like artists that like to convince <laughs> the people in charge to give us that money, that was the biggest challenge. Um, and uh, yeah, but I mean, the Center Theater was nothing but generous and really, I mean... They the, gave us the money. They gave us a lot of money. <laughs> they um, gave us a lot of money. <laughs> yes. I guess I'm curious, um, to this last point too, y'all have talked a lot about uh, you know, the, the aesthetic quality of your work, collectively and collaboratively, but I'd love to dig into like the, you know, the, the real parts that are on the other side, the money parts. Um, you were talking about you know, the power, like, how, and part of what I understand this weekend to be is about how um, histories and legacies, the realities around us, you know, are built, the references are built where they continue to pull from. And something I understand in your collective um, collaboration and how it's been built over time is like it comes from a history of like, y'all are yell people, like you're all from Yale, many of you from Yale. Um, that's part of where your collaboration was built. Like, I, I'd love to hear more of like, how do you wrestle with that collectively? You know, like obviously this work, you employed so many black folks, right? Like there are, there are like lots of amazing things about it. It's also an old white play. Like, can I, I would love to hear more about how y'all, if you do wrestle with that. In your 
Oh. I'm just gonna re I'm just gonna recount the question for my folks in the spill out room. Hey, let's talk about the real um, impacts of the fact that we come from like let's say institutions like Yale. How do we deal with the fact that we're working um, historically within um, structures that have not always included folks like us, and how we deal with the realities of that? Go ahead, Montana. And 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 our ability to kind of keep coming up to each other. This will be our last question. Yes. Um, well, the first thing I wanted to say is that what's really, um, it, it should be said that Lincoln Center, in particular, because of its nonprofit status, right, is capable of doing something like Skin of Our Teeth, where, like, c trying to put up Skin of Our Teeth in Midtown, I think, <laughs> um, would have been an impossibility, right? So there is, um, I just think it's important to kind of, like, think about that, too, in, in the conversation. I also think, like, um, yeah, like we have this prestige of Yale behind us, which um, has a benefit, obviously. But all of us were not only like uh, are are not um, cis white hetero men, but um, we also come from like I don't come from money. I come from your humble means. Hum <laughs> yeah, you know, like I went to Yale because it was free. Yeah, like, we got um, scholarships. <laughs> so uh, there's always this like reality that all of us share, and I think that's kind of how we f work together and thrive together. Is that like we understand our uh, our relationship to the outside, and then are also seeing the other productions getting given the money and the other designers getting given the money. And so our question is like, why aren't you giving it to us constantly? You know, give it to me too. And Liana is a great leader in that oh, too. You like, like every team needs an amazing leader that ha has very strong values that they demand of institutions, even though it's very scary. And I, my field is really predominantly men. I work with a lot of men and I, I feel glad that I'm holding space with that, but I constantly, have comparisons of like, oh, I'm actually not asking for everything that I need, but like being led by someone who does ask that makes me have, have the ability to do that as well. Yeah, I mean, I talk, I talk a lot outside of this about loyalty. I think that like generationally, our generation and below has like a strong loyalty um, that is like now coming up against the commercial um, world in that like the commercial world doesn't care about loyalty. Um, and so like I send out, to, I get hired on a commercial project, I send out a list of lighting designers or costume designers I like. It's mostly populated by like women and BIPOC designers and I get back an email asking for a second list, which basically means like, can you give me the veterans of theater design, which in the end ends up being mostly white cis men. Um, and so, and I'm, you know, arguing all the time, I feel, I feel uh, welcomed in that I'm getting these offers at all, but you know, it's about holding the door open behind you and keeping that loyalty and Liliana as a director and so many, you know, directors that I, we all work with are just so loyal to fight for us, to like keep bringing us up with. And I, to, to address, I think what's part of your question too, is that there is, I mean, I think that it's something that I've, I've thought about a lot post-graduation, right, there is a privilege that comes with going to an institution like Yale. And so to me, that means that there's also an accountability and a responsibility um, to use that privilege uh, uh, for other people's benefit, right? So I, I know that in particular, all of us have um, I mean, the, the thing that I do have access to is giving people opportunities to work on the teams. And so all of us have uh, assistants and associates who I don't think any of them went to, to Yale, you know, um, which isn't Yale or not Yale. It's just kind of like, I think it's important to kind of like acknowledge the privilege that that access um, gives, but then also what do you do? Um, with that. Yeah, what you gonna do? She's telling me to wrap up. I'm gonna tell you all that in some ways, like the collaborative ethos I think that we've built is one out of love, right? And I think in some ways that is a tremendous underestimated, under talked about power of changing and manifesting different realities for each other. If there's anything that theater can do, it can give us that opportunity to imagine those possibilities. And with that, let's give